Well, the weather outside is frightful, but the fire is so delightful. We've got no place to go. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rainier Books to my channel. It's Sunday, November the 20th, and I'm singing this beautiful song because outside is a lot of snow. Uh, we have 24 centimeters of snow on my balcony. I just measured it up. 24 centimeters. I don't know how many inches that is. I will um, put a sign up below how much and up up above how much uh, this is in inches. But let's sing not the song by Dean Martin. Let's do something about the Sunday. Usually I do my wrap up. Usually I tell you about the books that I've read in the last week that I finished and books that I'm planning to read next week. But since I haven't finished anyone, anyone. I have decided to do give you finally what I wanted to give you earlier in this November, the top 10 nonfiction books for November, for nonfiction November of 2022. I think I found some great works, some works from this year, published this year, some older work that is very timely, that is very important for us to go through. And some other books are really discoveries to me. Let's get started. I tell you, nonfiction is really a kind of genre, if it is a genre, because there's so many subgenres to nonfiction. But nonfiction is really also a segment of books, of published books and texts that is so enormously interesting. And once you start researching for interesting books in nonfiction, you can never stop. You can never, you always find something new. I found 10 books here on this list that are really, really good. I haven't read them myself. They're, they're a pile of interest, as somebody has called it here on Booktube. There are books that are very interesting to me and I hope very interesting to you. And I will definitely go to some of these books. The first of the books that I want to promote here that I want to tell you about was actually nominated for one of Britain's finest prizes. It didn't make, make the shortlist, but it didn't win. And this is um, by the American professor... Caroline Elkins. She is a professor at Harvard, born in 1969 for history and African and Afro-American studies at Harvard University. She has already won a super great award in 2006 when she published in 2005 her work where she covered Britain's history in her book Imperial Reckoning, the untold story of Britain's gulag in Kenya, where she told the world that the UK, after the Second World War, after using Kenyan soldiers in the Second World War as cannon fodder, that they have built concentration camps for more than 1.2 million Kenyan citizens in Kenya after the Second World War, which, is, which was quite unknown until Elkins wrote about it and gave a detailed account about it, which won her the Pulitzer in 2006. Now she is troubling the Brits again. Sorry, my British friends. She has written a book that I will give you a brick warning about. You know, a brick is a very large stone, and sometimes books are like bricks, and this one is a brick, but a very interesting, a very beautiful one. Caroline Elkin's new book is Legacy of Violence, A History of the British Empire by Caroline Elkins. And it was published by Boldly Head on March 24 of 2022. This book has not 100, it has not 400, not 600, not 700, but 896 pages, including annotations. But it's worthwhile reading. I'm very sure about this. Sprawling across a quarter of the world's landmass and claiming nearly 700 million people, Britain's empire was the largest in the history of humankind. For many, it epitomized the nation's cultural superiority, but what legacy have we delivered to the world? Spanning more than 200 years of history, Caroline Elkins reveals an evolutionary and racialized doctrine that espoused an unrelenting deployment of violence to secure and preserve British imperial interests. She outlines in this book how ideological foundations of violence were rooted in Victorian calls for punishing indigenous peoples who resisted subjugation and how over time this treatment became increasingly systematized. 
and she makes clear that when Britain could no longer maintain control over the violence it provoked and enacted, Britain retreated from its empire, destroying and hiding incriminating evidence of its policies and practices. Drawing on more than a decade of research for this book, on four continents where she traveled to, Legacy of Violence implicates all sides of the political divide regarding the creation, execution, and cover-up of imperial violence. By demonstrating how and why violence was the most salient factor underwriting both the empire and British imperial identity, Elkins explores long-held myths and sheds a disturbing new light on empire's role in shaping the world of today. And the Queen Elizabeth II, who died earlier this year, she was very much a symbol of this empire. So this book, the first book, I think is a very strong one, very strong choice, is Legacy of Violence, A History of the British Empire by Professor Caroline Elkins. Even the second book sounds so interesting to me. It's totally, completely different, but it has to do with colonialism, and it takes us to another part of the world, to North America, to one of my favorite countries, to Canada, the country of the Maple Leaf. It's called Red Paint, the Ancestral Autobiography of a Coast Salish Punk by Sasha Lapointe, published by Counterpoint on March 8, 2022. An indigenous artist blends the aesthetics of punk rock with the traditional spiritual practices of the women in her lineage and this bold contemporary journey to reclaim her heritage and unleash her power and voice while searching for a permanent home. Sasha Tagsabu Lapointe has always longed for a sense of home. When she was a child, her family moved around frequently, often staying in barely habitable church attics and trailers, dangerous places for young Sasha. With little more to guide her than a passion for the thriving punk scene of the Pacific Northwest and a desire to live up to the responsibility of being the namesake of her beloved great-grandmother, a linguist who helped preserve her indigenous language of Lushotseed, Sasha throws herself headlong into the world, determined to build a better future for herself and her people. Set against the backdrop by the breathtaking beauty of Coast Salish ancestral land and imbued with the universal spirit of punk, Red Paint is ultimately a story of the ways we learn to find our true selves while fighting for our right to claim a place of our own. Examining what it means to be vulnerable in love and in art, Sasha offers up an unblinking reckoning with personal traumas amplified by the collective historical traumas of colonialism and genocide that continue to haunt native peoples. Red Paint is an intersectional autobiography of lineage, resilience, and above all, the ability to heal. Well, second strong choice, I think. Uh, the third one is uh, I got to know last week when the National Book Award announced the winner of the National Book Award for Nonfiction of 2022. And of course, this is the book by Imani Parry, South to America, Journey Below the Mason Dixon to Understand the Soul of a Nation. That is a very interesting book about the American South, about personal stories, about biographies of people of immigrant communities, of contemporary artists, of opportunists, enslaved peoples, unsung heroes and their ancestors that weaves together... Um, a book about the American South that explains why we need to understand the American South to be able to understand America. And that is South to America by Imani Parry. The third book on this list, published in January, 20, January 25, 2022 by Echo. The fourth book comes from a Jamaican writer. He has written poetry, he has written novels, but he also now has published a bunch of essays published by Canongate Gate Books on May 5, 2022. This is Things I Have Withheld by Kay Miller. In this astonishing collection of essays, the award-winning poet and novelist Kay Miller explores the silence in which so many important things are kept. He examines the experience of discrimination through this silence and what it means to breach it, to risk words, to risk truths. And he considers the histories our bodies inherit, the crimes that haunt them, and how meaning can shift as we move throughout the world, variously assuming privilege or victimhood. 
through letters to James Baldwin, encounters with Liam Neeson, Soka, Carnival, Family Secrets, Love Affairs, White Women's Tears, Questions of Aesthetics, and more, Miller powerfully and imaginatively recounts everyday acts of racism and prejudice. With both the epigrammatic concision and conversional cadence of his poetry and his novels, Things I Have Withheld is a great artistic achievement, a work of beauty which challenges us to interrogate what seems unsayable and why. Our actions, defense mechanisms, imaginations and interactions, and those of the world around us. This is a collection of essays. The next nonfiction book that I have on my top 10 list for nonfiction November is An Exchange of Letters, which was quite normal some decades ago, but now people don't write letters anymore, but some do. And these two authors have exchanged a bunch of letters throughout the pandemic uh, with COVID-19. And I speak of Robin Maynard and Leanne Beta Samusake Simpson. They have exchanged letters and they published them under the title Rehearsals for Living by Haymarket Books on August 11 of 2022. When much of the world entered pandemic lockdown in spring 2020, Robin Maynard, the influential author of Policing Black Lives, and Leanne Bittas, and uh, sorry, and Leanne Bitta Samusake Simpson, award-winning author of several books, including the recent novel New Piming, began writing each other letters, a gesture sparked by friendship and solidarity and by a desire for kinship and connection in a world shattering under the intersecting crisis of pandemic police killings and climate catastrophe. Their letters soon grew into a powerful exchange on the subject of where we go from here. Rehearsals is a captivating book, part debate, part dialogue, part lively and detailed familiar correspondence between two razor-sharp writers convening on what it means to get free as the world spins to some new orbit. In a genre-defying exchange, the authors collectively envision the possibilities for more liberatory futures during a history historic year of indigenous and land defense, prison strikes, and global black-led rebellions against policing. By articulating to each other black and indigenous perspectives on our unprecedented here and now, and the long disavowed histories of slavery and colonization that have brought us to this moment in the first place, Maynard and Simpson create something new, a vital demand for a different way forward and a poetic call to dream up new ways of ordering earthly life. Letters between two female authors, Robin Maynard and Leanne Bettasamosake Simpson, Rehearsals for Living. Number six on my list of the top 10 books is a book that is a bit older, but it's very timely. Just today, the climate conference in Shamar El Sheikh in Egypt ended to the great disappointment of many environmental activists in the world with Again, a result that is not going to save us from climate catastrophes. And three years ago, the American journalist David Wallace Wells wrote his best-selling book, The Uninhabitable Earth, A Story of the Future, published by Alan Lane in 2019. It is worse, much worse than you think. That's how this book starts. And David Wallace Wells is giving us a, a view into the world that we are facing if we don't succeed in stopping the train that goes into the abyss. The train that raises the climate, the temperature on the earth by two, three, four degrees, whatever. We already have ice bears starving to death at Svalbard outside the coast of Norway. We already have the poles melting. We already have people who flee because of climate change. And the 1.5 million Syrian refugees, David Wallace Wells says in this book, The Uninhabitable Earth, that came to Europe in 2015 and 2016 due to the war in Syria, that is just a very small beginning. If we don't stop this, we will have 150 million refugees coming to our countries. Because the third, so-called third world, quotation mark, is the world which is first un uninhabitable, but they don't have produced this catastrophe. We in the rich countries, we have produced this. And already on the climate conference in Shamar el-Sheikh and now next year in France and Paris, the leaders of the world 
President Macron of France and others are debating on what to pay to the countries who will suffer the most in the next years from climate change, as if we could pay pain with money, as if we could heal pain or death with money. David Wallace, a very important book. And the next book, Buch is German. The next one is number seven, is a book that I missed when it came out about 11 years ago. But I think also in connection to climate change, we have to deal with this as well. And that's why I throw it in here as uh, one of the 10 most important books right now to read. This is Eating Animals, Should We Stop? by Jonathan Safran Four, published by Penguin on January 27 in 2011. And the publisher says about this world best-selling book, Eating Animals is the most original and urgent book on the subject of food written the century. It will change the way you think and change the way you eat for good. Whether you're flirting with veterinary, trying to cut back on animal consumption, or a lifelong meat eater, you need to read this book. And many people I know who have read this book have said, I will not eat meat anymore in my life. Meat is not only are we harming animals, we, which we put in horrible industrious production of their bodies that we, we, we just sort of create their life in order to kill it when it's ripe for us to eat it. Um, but it's also destroying the planet and climate catastrophe has a lot to do with also the, the need for meat. And I have to look in America to To the, to the people probably who eat the most hamburgers in the world. And that's when, when Donald Trump said in connection to climate change that he doesn't believe in, he said, they're coming to take your hamburgers, coming to take your burgers. Yeah, we, probably we have to come and take the burgers for the future. Eating Animals, Jonathan Safran Four. The book number eight is also connected to the United States because very much we have to see what happens now in the next elections when we... Um, The presidential elections, Donald Trump is running. We have this Marjorie Green woman from Georgia, the blonde Republican who denies everything, who believes in aliens and whatever. And sometimes I think this could lead to a civil war, what happens right now in the US. And I'm not alone. The uh, researcher Barbara F. Walters wrote a book and published it by Crown on January 11 this year. Her book is called How Civil Wars Start and How to Stop Them. Political violence rips apart several towns in southwest Texas. A far-right militia plots to kidnap the governor of Michigan and try her for treason. An armed mob of Trump supporters theorists storms the U.S. Capitol. We know what has happened and what might happen. Very bad things might happen. If you, if you saw the, the um, midterm elections, there was in some Midwestern state there were um, paramilitary troops from some right-wing organization who just checked if the election was correct. There was a standing outside the the um, place where people are going to vote, were going to vote with their guns and with their camouflage, uh, just to show that the elections are secure and safe. Well, are these things isolated? Is this isolated? Barbara F. Walters has spent her career studying civil conflicts in places like Iraq, Ukraine, and Sri Lanka. But now she has become increasingly worried about her own country. And this book is about um, the experience from civil wars in other countries in the United States and the likelihood that it might happen or how can we do, what can we do to not let it happen, to stop it. The uh, book number 10 on my, number nine, I'm sorry, on my list is The Road to Unfreedom by Timothy Snyder. This is one of the few books that I already, the last two books I already have read. Uh, The Road to Unfreedom by Timothy Snyder was published by Vintage on March 1 in 2019. It's one of the most important books on democracy today. We have this horrible war in Ukraine going on. We have Russia, a fascist government in Russia who's trying to destroy another nation's sovereignty and another nation's people. It's a genocide that happens in Ukraine each and every day. And there are Russian fascists who dream of a Russian empire that is beginning in the West, in Lisbon, Portugal, and it goes all over the European and Asian landmass to Vladivostok in the East. This is what some people in Russia want to accomplish. And Timothy Snyder, professor at Yale University, a man who can explain history um, very lively and very beautifully. He has 
uh, dealt all his life with Russia and Ukraine and with the history of the Soviet Union and the former republics of the Soviet Union. And in the Road to Unfreedom, he shows and he showed in 2019 how Russia is trying to influence elections like they did with the 2016 elections in the United States, how they influence um, popular votes like the Brexit vote in Great Britain in 2015 and uh, how they are starting cyber wars, how they are supporting the radical right more or less in many countries and how they try to disturb and try to bring the European and American dialogue out of balance in order to sort of play their dirty game. Timothy Snyder, the road to unfreedom, because this road leads to unfreedom and it's the fight between the politics of eternity and the politics of inevitability that is very much beautiful explained in this great book by timothy snyder and the last one i also read um the last one on my top 10 list of non-fiction books for you to read in non-fiction november and i just got it here that is professor kehindi andrews from i think bristol in england and he um, is a professor for Black Studies. He wrote this beautiful book, The New Age of Empire, How Racism and Colonialism Still Rule the World. And Kehinde Andrews is like a twin brother to another man that I admire very much, Ibram X. Kendi from the United States, who is also a researcher on racism, also an activist against racism. And both Andrews and Kehinde... Um, boop, 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 boop. Both Andrews and Kendi are really great in explaining the history of mankind as a history of racism. And it's true. It's nothing that we uh, should sort of bury our heads in the sand if we are white. We just have to show solidarity and we have to show our um, support for sort of abolishing every kind of racism that's going on. And exactly like uh, Ibram X. Kendi says that you cannot say that I'm not a racist if you are not an anti-racist. Kendi says that in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, he says you can, either you are a racist or you are an anti-racist. There's nothing in between. If you see racism, if you uh, see that somebody is treated ra uh, racistically in a racistic way, then you have to do something against it. You have to be an anti-racist and support this person to uh, be an ally to this person, to this movement, whatever. Otherwise, you are on the side of the racist. So this either this or that. And Kehinde Andrews almost does the same thing. He says that in order to abolish the system of racism and colonialism that still exists on this planet, he also speaks of a new colonialism here uh, for a chapter where he speaks about China, uh, making other countries in Africa, in South America, even in Asia, um, totally dependent on China and on Chinese influence. This is a new age of colonialism. And also the old colony states like Britain, the USA, the Germany, and uh, we all are treating other poorer countries like we are still their sovereigns and we can do, we can order them to do things more or less. That is what Andrew's saying in this book. And I think it's very true. And the only thing that we can do against it is, says Kehinde Andrews, revolution. Revolution is not only possible, revolution is essential. And these were the 10 books for non-fiction November that I would highly recommend to you. If you have anything that I have missed, please tell me in the comments down below. If you read anything that is really touching you, that's really making you very emotional in non-fiction in November, then please tell me. And thank you very much for watching this video. Those who return to the channel, again, thank you so much. Those who are for the first time in a video of Rainier Books, please, please subscribe to the channel. I would love to have 1,000 subscribers by Christmas. That would be such a great Christmas present to me. And I want to do more videos for you in the near future. I, have, I hope that you have a great reading week now in the next week. Let it snow here in Sweden and let's see what it brings. Thank you and bye-bye.